Hello and welcome to this Intelligent Squared online debate, Can the Internet Be Made Safe? Now, not that long ago, as the internet was just taking off and we were all beguiled by its promise of democratising information, the sharing of knowledge and allowing every voice to be heard, it would have seemed mad to be asking how we make the experience of logging on in the safety of our own homes less dangerous. But here we are, after years of watching social media course and public discourse, make it common for people to be threatened and bullied daily for their beliefs, spread fake news and conspiracy theories, and even lure teenagers towards self-harm and suicide. For many, the time has come to impose some order on the digital Wild West. With Parliament currently grappling with an online safety bill and tech companies adapting and developing faster than it takes to get any form of legislation to even the committee stage in this country, is it even possible? And if so, what should le regulation and legislation look like? In a moment, we're going to be hearing from our distinguished panel of speakers on what feels like an incredibly urgent question. Can the internet be made safe? If you'd like to join the discussion by sending in questions for our speakers, please do. In the second half of this session, we'll aim to get through as many of them as possible. So please do start sending them in now. You can do that by typing a question in the box at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't want your name to be mentioned, then please click the anonymous button before you press send. You can also tweet us by using the hashtag IQ2. Now, I'm delighted to introduce you to our three brilliant speakers tonight. We're joined by Margaret Hodge, veteran Labour MP who's represented Barking and Dagenham since 1994. She held a number of ministerial roles in the last Labour government with portfolios across education, work and pensions, business, and crucially for tonight's discussion, culture, media and sport. She also served as the chair of the Public Accounts Committee from 2010 to 2015, when she became known as the scourge of tax avoiders. We're also joined tonight by Jamie Bartlett, director of the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media, a collaboration between the University of Sussex and the think tank Demos. He's the author of The Dark Net, Inside the Digital Underworld, Radicals, Outsiders Changing the World, and The People Versus Tech. He's also a fellow podcaster. In 2019, he wrote and presented the huge hit BBC series, The Missing Crypto Queen. If you haven't heard it, I think you should. Um, it exposed the biggest ever cryptocurrency scandal. And he's also now turning that into a book, which will be published in June 2022. Lastly, tonight, we're joined by David Babs, an online safety campaigner and political strategist at Clean Up the Internet. He was previously the founding executive director of 38 Degrees, an organisation that used digital technology and social media to involve millions of people in the political process. Welcome all. Now, my first question to you tonight is about online anonymity. It's one of the big debates around any new le legislation. And it's one of those things that uh, I think most of us will be wondering, why is it that <clears throat> when society has outlawed so many things in the real world, like hate speech, incitement to violence or rape threats, why are they allowed to go completely unpunished online? Do we need to take away online anonymity to hold people accountable? Um, Jamie, why don't you go first? Thanks, Mandeline. Thank you very much, everybody, and Intelligence Squared. Um, I hate to be in the position of sort of defending the bad stuff on the internet, because I've also spent my whole career really studying all the terrible things that happen online. So I'm not going to deny it that that's, it's terrible and we should try and do something to make it better. But I don't think we want to necessarily make the internet safe, because safe on its own is not necessarily the, the, the sort of the, the, the role that we want the internet to play in society. It could be safer, but not necessarily safe. And anonymity in particular, I don't think getting rid of that would, would actually solve the problems that we're facing. There's a couple of reasons for that, and I'll be brief on it because we'll want to discuss it. Well, the first thing is an anonymity is not the only reason. It's a contributing reason, but I don't think it's the only reason people do nasty things online. Um, really famous study from the 90s, the first real study of online disinhibition by a cyber psychologist, an amazing job back then, called John Suler, who talked about the online disinhibition effect. Why are we meaner online than offline? Anonymity, the feeling of anonymity was one of the things, but it wasn't the only one. 
it was a lack of it was a distance from people it was a lack of contemporaneity he said you know you 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 wait hours before you reply to people and anger bubbles up in, in your mind over what they've said you don't have to see them face to face getting trying to like, anonymity or getting rid of anonymity wouldn't change those things we'd still be behind a screen we'd still be capable of being nasty and mean to each other and indeed a, a lot of the nastiness that we see online probably comes from comes from other parts of the world places parts of the internet that we'd never really be able to remove the anonymity so we'd end up sort of removing anonymity from certain people but leaving it for some of the people who do some of the worst things unless we don't want to have a free and open internet anymore and we want to block certain parts of the internet off unless they follow the, the rules on anonymity that we place. Even in my own job, you mentioned the missing crypto queen. I'm trying to expose an enormous Ponzi scheme. And to do that, I would very often have to go on social media or into forums, chat rooms, undercover, using a fake name. Any small move, that would make it harder for me to do that, I wouldn't want to do my job anymore. I'd be too scared. I wouldn't want to be an investigative journalist. Um, and then you've got to think about how, that's just me, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm a, probably quite an unusual person in that regard, but there's so many other people in some ways that want to go online and express themselves, and they're terrified that if people found out who they were, they would get bullied, they'll get fired, all these, all these like, very, very negative side effects that you'd have from removing anonymity, where I think the gains would actually be quite marginal. You'd still see a lot of hatred and anger and bullying and all the terrible things that we see. And finally, I still can't work out how we'd actually do anything to get rid of it. I still can't figure out what the sort of the technological solution to it would be, because one of my great worries is handing more and more data over to governments, more and more data over to tech platforms. Haven't we learned over the last couple of years how bad that is, what that leads to? And the idea that the answer to our problems is to give them more and more and more about proving who we are, that to me is a no-go. So, like I said, <laughs> It's not that I, I can see the problems. I know it does contribute to the problems, but I just don't think for the gains we'd, we'd, we'd get for it, it's worth the cost. Margaret, on the same Well, question. I think we are going we, uh, Thanks, Manveen. And I think we are going to have an interesting debate. Can I start by saying, I think all of us, we'll see when David contributes, but I've worked and talked to David before. All of us want to protect anonymity online. What we want to tackle is anonymous abuse. And I make that distinction, we'll go on and, 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 and develop that. So I, the first thing I want to say is when, when this, when online first happened, I was with Jamie 100%. I thought this is fantastic. It facilitates democratic participation. It allows us to hear voices that you could never hear before. And I really, really you know, warmly, warmly supported. I was an advocate for it. And then um, I started having my own experience of it. And if I just say to you that, in a, particularly when I fought um, anti-Semitism, so I was fighting racism in the Labour Party, in a two-month period uh, when the uh, report was published on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party by the EHRC, and then there were all the comings and goings about Jeremy Corbyn's position. In that two-month period from October to, to December, I don't look at my own online abuse anymore. The, uh, an organisation monitors it for me, Community Security Trust, brilliant organisation. I had 90,000 mentions, 90,000 in two months, uh, of which the majority were abusive. And I just want to share with you, and I'm going to go on because it's not just about, it's clearly not about me, but that brought me into it, the sort of things that could go online. So, for example, why has half of 1% of our population got so much power? Rid us of this cancer. That was uh, Jews. Um, I'm called a Zionist bitch, a Zionist stooge. A swastika is appropriate as Israel is a fascist state. And then I'm going to read one which might uh, uh, touch some sensibilities. I want her to feel despised. It's what the bitch deserves. I so hope somebody kills her. I really do. She's a lying, deceitful, hateful bitch who needs to be executed publicly so we can watch and laugh at her. 
The only support she deserves is a handrail to climb the gallows, the vile fucking cunt. So it's horrible. And it's not just that, that the sort of racism that I have faced. It's a, really for children, for young people. We know that um, young people, particularly that there's an increase in the suffering of mental health problems from what they get. There's been a massive increase in self-harm and in uh, suicide and in sexual exploitation, all those issues. Now, you can't actually say that there's a... a, a, a there's a correlation between the two, but you can, you know, it, it, you can't, sorry, you can't put a causal, causal um, uh, relationship between the two, but you can say that there's a correlation between the increase in those, uh, in those issues and uh, the growth of young people using online. Then you have things like uh, the racism. We saw that with the Euro 2020 final, where over 2,000 uh, abusive messages posted there using the N word and uh, using monkey um, uh, and Joyce as well. Then you've got misinformation, the anti vaxxers, the people who talk about uh, uh, things like Dettol uh, solving all the problems of coronavirus. Then you've got fraudulent, uh, all the fraudulent advertisements that are on there that uh, uh, get people into absolutely appalling financial trouble and losing money. And you've got hate crime. So there's a massive, a massive, massive. It is a real problem, Jamie, and we have to tackle it. You can't just push it to one side. And nobody is pretending that tackling anonymous abuse will get rid of all abuse. Of course it won't. It's not. It, but it's an important, I think, ingredient in it. Just talk a little bit about public opinion. Most of the public now think in a recent YouGov poll, four out of five, 78 percent, people favoured requesting users of platforms to disclose their real identity. So there is some support for There is a great support for it among the public. And the other thing to talk, talk about, which I only recognised when I started getting involved in the issue, is actually the business model of the platform is based on there being a lot of abuse traffic. Because the more abuse that there is online, the more people watch it, therefore the greater the traffic, therefore the more they can uh, uh, get from their ad, uh, from de uh, demands for advertising uh, from those who want to advertise on the platform. So the business model depends on allowing and not getting rid of online abuse. And I think that's really important as to why should there be government intervention. This isn't something that will resolve itself because it's not in their interest to do that. And can I just say something else, which I think is really important? I don't know. You know, here I was, a great supporter and promoter of anonymity. Then I start getting this horrible stuff. And actually, what it is, it, the, what people try to do through anonymous abuse is paint you as a vile, awful person. So for me, I'm a paedophile, I'm a tax avoider, I, uh, have, I've killed Palestinian children. Those are the sort of things that are said about me online. And therefore, they undermine my credibility. When I talk about anything, I could talk about royalty, I could talk about tax, which I try to talk about a lot. But because I'm a horrible person that can't be trusted, uh, there is no credibility in what I say. So my own freedom to participate in a democratic forum is therefore undermined by the way that the abuse undermines me personally. And I think that's an important thing to hold in, 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 in mind. So I do support anonymity. I think it's hugely important for the sort of issues that Jamie talked about, but for victims of domestic violence, children who want to go on anonymously who've been victims of child abuse. I think it's hugely important for whistleblowers. All of that, what I want to tackle, and as we develop this evening, Manvi, and I hope it becomes clear, what I want to tackle is online abuse. And I think there is a way in which you can maintain anonymity, but start to tackle that online abuse. We'll come to Dave in just a second. Um, Margaret, you talked about credibility there and how damaging it can be. Um, I wonder if before we move on, you could just sort of give people, I know you've, you have an organisation that filters some of the content that's coming towards you, but could you just talk people through what it feels like to be at the bottom of one of those pylons for like the course, you know, over the course of 24 hours? 
What does it do to a person? Oh, that's such a difficult question because you have to learn to understand that it's not the real me that they're attacking. And if I wasn't able to do that to distance myself as who I am, you know, what I care about, what I value, what my friends think about, what my interests are, if I couldn't do that, I think I'd be destroyed. So I think that's a, a, a technique I've learned in politics. They don't, this isn't the real me, that this isn't the, who I am that they're attacking. It's it's a sort of, you know, it's a false uh, view of my persona. So that's one thing. That The other thing I would say to you is actually at the height of this abuse, and I'm still getting it. I still, every time I say anything, I get a torrent of abuse. Uh, what it, it, it makes you very suspicious. I think that's the main thing is I'll walk into a room and whereas I would have previously, I'm a quite outgoing, friendly sort of person, being, being confident there, I tend to look around me and think, who's on my side? Who's here to attack me? And that's something I never did before. And I do think twice about when I put stuff on. I do think, I mean, I have to, you have to be brave to do it. And I mean, and the only way, you know, I, I won't let them defeat me, beat me. But equally, I sort of do it by trying to say, it's not the me they're talking about, horrible though that it is. And I didn't read out to you some of the most awful, vile stuff that I get. It's really, it wasn't the worst. I can't imagine how much worse it gets. Um David, where do you stand on the question of online anonymity? Well, I wouldn't ban it, um, but I would suggest that there's a lot platforms could be doing to reduce its misuse and restrict the ability of anonymous accounts to do harm. And I think there are three obvious things which all the platforms could be doing. Um, the first is offer all their users a right to verify themselves if, if they choose to do so. Um, most of the platforms offer that to a sliver of their users. Um, some of us have got a blue tick by our, by our Twitter profiles or whatever, but that's a very elite option at the moment. I would offer transparency to all users as to who has chosen to verify and who hasn't, so we can make our own mind up about what that says about the credibility of what they're, what they're saying. We're always exhorting people to check the sources, think critically about the sources, but we deprive them of that key bit of information at the moment. And finally, I would give each user more choice and control over the extent to which they see content and interact with unverified accounts. So though, no, knowing that um, anonymous accounts are more likely to, to be abusive, um, that's different people have a different appetite for, 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 for taking that risk and you should give those choices. Um, now, I don't think that's not a magic bullet. It wouldn't solve all abuse um, for some of the reasons Jamie has mentioned, but I think it would make a huge difference. Um, we've, we've studied at Clean Up the Internet the, the way in which anonymity is misused. Um, and it tends, the difference between um, benign uses of anonymity and harmful ones tend to center around two behaviors, which those proposals that I've just outlined would bear down on. The first is abuse, abusive use of anonymity. Often it's, uns it's about unsolicited communication. It's communication that people don't want to hear. So give people that extra control. Secondly, it's about deception and inauthenticity. It's not just that people are hiding their identities. It's that they're deceiving people about who they are. So again, make it more transparent transparent to people. But by making those, underpinning all of that by a voluntary right to, right to verify, you don't shut out those legitimate uses. People can still build a following, can still engage online with, with, with the choice to remain anonymous. It's just clearer to people who is anonymous and who isn't. And everyone can make their own mind up how much they want to interact with those accounts. Now, Jamie mentioned one study of, uh, and he quite rightly, highlighted that anonymity isn't the only factor that makes people nasty online. But there's been a lot of studies since, and there's a lot of evidence that it is a really significant factor. Recently, UK internet users who'd suffered abuse were asked to, to report what, le what level of that came from anonymous accounts, and it was in the, in the 70s, so over 70% of UK victims of online abuse reported that coming from anonymous accounts. Another study on Twitter, which, you know, random control study where they gave some users um, anonymous Twitter handles and some uh, named ones and asked them to engage in sexist content, found not only were the anonymous ones more likely to retweet sexist jokes, but they were then more, even more alarmingly likely to act in a more sexist and discriminatory way offline, having 
the practice of that behavior online. So this, it, it has a real impact on how people behave. Um, and really, what the, the way I would frame this is that anonymity is a risk factor, and it's one which platforms make choices about how they manage through their design. And Margaret touched on the, the, the question of a business model. At the moment, platforms they aren't designing their approach to anonymity with a view to maximizing freedom of expression or safety. They're designing their platforms with a view to maximizing their profits. And uh, the, 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 the kind of measures that I'm suggesting simply aren't incentivized by an advertising business model, which is seeking to maximize attention and ma maximize engagement and maximize user numbers. Um, it introduces friction. It sheds a bit of light on how much their account, the account numbers that they can claim to advertisers are inflated by inauthentic accounts. And this is where I think we need to not leave those kind of decisions in the sole control of, of these platforms. They're too much of a public square for it to be left to that. And that's, that's where independent regulation, the introduction of some social obligations onto those platforms to manage risk factors like anonymity more responsibly, that's, that's where we've got to get to, which I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it is possible. Jamie, um, it, from David's analysis there, it sounds like it, it is having a more toxifying effect um, than, than we'd previously thought. Can we really manage with, with no, you know, with, with complete anonymity now? I mean, how, how do you sort of answer the, the sort of experiences that Margaret's had and the, the abuse that people are facing? How do you, how do you get around that? Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always horrified to hear the sort of abuse that people like Margaret get. So I obviously you'd never want to defend that. The question is always, to me, the extent to which a significant difference would be made and the costs that would come with that. But David's suggestions seem to be somewhere in the middle. So we're not talking about banning it entirely or, you know, preventing people who need to remain anonymous online on social media from doing that, but rather making it slightly easier for people to see what they're doing and who's anonymous and who's not. And the reason it matters is partly because we... we we don't talk enough, I don't think, about the positives that the, the ability to be anonymous at certain times does bring. We've got to talk as well about the importance of, of encouraging a free and open internet. All around the world, regimes are closing down on the idea of a free and open internet, and it always comes down to the same thing. Make people be forced online to show who they are, to give their documents over, to have all of their behaviour monitored. And we need to not move in that direction. So where we can find some middle ground, where it helps people be slightly more critical, encourage us users to work out what different people are doing, then I'm, I'm definitely behind talking about that and working out how that can operate. But, the, for example, the case of the racist abuse of football players in on Twitter following Euro 2020, the overwhelming majority, according to Twitter anyway, of those accounts were identified. Well, we should chat about that, Jamie. Yeah, quite we can. Talking, so. <laughs> and so much of that abuse comes from non-UK accounts. So my question is always, how are we going to deal with the overwhelming majority or the, the insignificant amount of online abuse that doesn't come from this country? How do we stop that from no, happening? Because there's, that is there's a be... lot of... There's a lot of nodding of heads going on uh, in, the, in the other direction. So I'm going to go to um, Margaret first. OK, I mean, just to deal with the Twitter point, I wrote to Twitter and said, could I have the basis for their, uh, uh, their survey? And they have refused to share it with me. I just don't think uh, you, you can look at that as a legitimate finding. You know, just to say to you, Jamie, really, and I'll share that. Whoops. I'll share that that correspondence uh, with you if, if that's helpful. I don't actually go along with David, as he knows. I don't go along with David's solution uh, entirely, although I'm trying to find a, a different little way. The reason I don't go along with David's solution is twofold. First of all, I don't... I, I want to see, I don't see why the, the only way in which I can protect myself is to say I'll only talk to people who aren't anonymous, who share their identity. I don't want that. 
I want to deal with an anonymous uh, people who, you know, who, I do want whistleblowers to contact me. I do want victims of domestic violence and child abuse to be able to contact me. I don't want to shut that off because they don't do that. And the second argument against David's solution is that actually the police, I'm obviously in touch with the police quite a lot, Mandy, because of the nature of the abuse I get. And the police say the worst thing you can do if you're trying to identify a real threat to you individually. And I accept that that is, I mean, it isn't as remote as we thought, as we saw with the tragic death of David Amos. But the worst thing you can do is cut off the uh, the traffic that you're getting the, the online. You've got to know so that they can judge whether or not it's serious. So I don't agree with that. And let me put forward my middle way, which I know David knows, but I haven't shared with Jamie. I think what we should do is anybody who goes on a platform should actually reveal the identity, not to the platform, Jamie, not to the platform, uh, although they know all about us because we know that from the, what, the advertising that they throw at us all the time, but not to the platform, to a third party provider. Uh, uh, and it's perfectly technically feasible. Uh, we could use something like the banks. The banks already know 99% of people who, who uh, for a bank, that would give you the adult population. They're perfectly, so it's perfectly okay. And you are anonymous online. I want everybody to be anonymous. And the only time when you then uh, give up your right to anonymity, I think it's a right, is if you engage in abuse against other people. And at that point, the police, in pursuing illegal, illegal harm online, or me wanting to pursue a civil, uh, uh, a civil case against somebody who abuses me, would have the right not to go to the platform, but the platform would then get it from the third party. So the platform hasn't got the details. The third party has... And I have the right to access that, or the police do, uh, if and when there's a, uh, if they're harmful abuse. And linked to that, two other things that have to go with it. At the moment, the, the law in relation to online harms is too limited. And actually, Nadine Doris made a statement over the weekend where she tightened up and introduced three new. Uh, uh, she's going to introduce on the online harms bill three new offences, which would make it much tougher and would make it much more difficult, for example, to have revenge porn, to have a promotion of suicide, to have actually mm -hmm. sexual exploitation, people smuggling, all that stuff would be then t uh, created as a criminal offence. And that's really important. So I really welcome what she did. I should say, Mandy, that this debate is not a partisan debate. That, you know, I'm working on a cross-party uh, uh, basis with other people. And then the final thing I want to say is I think because of the way this, this is a business model for the online platforms, it's no good fining them zillions because that just becomes a business cost against their business, uh, against their business. And they're making so much money. They, you know, even the, what we're talking about wouldn't hurt them, harm them that much. I think you have to get director liability and responsibility into uh, uh, the legal framework that we would do for for uh, uh, monitoring and, and regulating online harms. Uh, and I do this from my tax, you know, my tax justice work. That it's no good getting at the corporations. That doesn't change. No good getting at the banks. No good getting at any of these people because that simply doesn't change their behaviour. If you introduce individual director liability where they break the law, so with these new offences where they don't take stuff off that could do all this massive damage, then they are individually liable. So I would. Go, it's a different solution to David's, but I think it's the only one that is sustainable. But I accept that, Jamie, I want to protect anonymity. But if you're going to do that, you have to deal with the online harms. David, you've had your solution questioned and another one posed. What do you make of it? Well, I, I, I know, Margaret, but you, 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 you'd say that they could be complementary, our, our different solutions, um, that one doesn't necessarily preclude the other. But I, I think that the thing that we would need to ensure, the, the advantage of, a, of a, a voluntary system based on a right to verify is that um, you've got that important backstop that if someone for whatever reason can't can't access the process of verification, um, whatever that process is, um, they they are still able to access um, the, the internet and that means of expression. And 
we would, with, with our voluntarist approach, still lay a heavy emphasis on the importance of accessibility in terms of verification. So not relying on too narrow a range of documents, offering a range of options, making sure that it's accessible, that it's privacy respecting, etc. But having that extra safeguard that no one no one is precluded from being able to access the platforms because because of an inability or a reluctance to verify but that could be a legitimate one it would need to be something that we'd need to address with, with, with Margaret's solution I'm not saying it can't be done but it would be that extra barrier but I wanted to come back for a minute to Jamie highlighting that Twitter claim about um online online abuse directed at footballers after the euros because after Margaret uh, contacted them and my organization contacted them as well seeking more information uh, they then offered some answers to the home affairs select committee and i was in some correspondence with some members of the dcms select committee and here's where i think we've got to with that claim i think in order to make the claim which twitter made that 99 percent of the abuse directed of england footballers was not anonymous they adopted a definition of not anonymous which would include an account called mickey mouse registered with the email address Mickey Mouse is not my real name at gmail.com um, because they would say that that person has provided a name and provided an email address um, and I mean you know there isn't a statutory definition of anonymity but I think that would be it's quite a sporty definition by most of our standards <laughs> I think if you're being charitable and I think this is a really good example it was a very helpful thing for Twitter to do in some ways because it demonstrates that at the moment, these kind of choices and these decisions are being taken by platforms with commercial interests and, you know, with a tendency to put spin on it. And that's that's where open, opening these processes and these kind of claims up, being giving independent experts access to the data to verify these kind of claims, but also giving ind bringing independent scrutiny to the design decisions they they make around on these kind of issues, whether that's on anonymity or on the design of their algorithms, on their approach to content moderation. I think they've shown many times that their agenda should not be able to drive all those decisions because when it does, they they tell fibs, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Jamie, do you want to come back on that before we move on to Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hard one to, 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 to resolve because all of us think, well, we like the idea of anonymity being used where it has its beneficial uses. Um, but we just want to cut out the bad bits of that. But then every technological solution you come to, I don't think fully uh, permits that. I think in the end that you always have to accept some of the bad with some of the good. So I mean, Margaret's example, maybe there is a technological way around this, but I just can't see how everyone would have to just to go onto like Telegraph comments or YouTube comments or Twitter or Facebook. I'm going to have to hand over some ID, some document, I don't know what it would be, to some third party database that would hold it there securely. So, I mean, it just gives me the creep. I really, it terrifies me that I'd have to do that. And it's as for family members of mine that would have to do that, they just wouldn't bother going online because they wouldn't know how to do it. And so, what would invariably happen, and you know this does always happen, that database in the end will probably get hacked because they all seem to in the end. And Jamie. then all of that data that links individual people, can you imagine what that would do if that database was hacked and then every individual uh, anonymous account's real identity was... Do you not if have you an can, online bank you, account? You, yeah, Jamie, you use PayPal. <laughs> if you don't do PayPal online, you give it anyway. And this whole thing... I think this is sort of, you know, they know all about us, for goodness sake. You know from everything you get online and when you sort of, you know, uh, you, they know absolutely you do anything online and immediately you get inundated with advertising that reflects that particular purchase you've made or the particular person, uh, pl a person you've written to. They know all about you. This idea that somehow there's grand anonymity and I would not give it to Facebook. I wouldn't give it to Twitter. I would give it to a third party. Not ideal. No, no, none of these things are 100% fail safe. But you just can't ignore the growing abuse. You can't do it. It was 
you know, I just say, I'm not saying this from a personal point of view. I'm not ignoring it, Margaret. I think the mistake is that when I say I'm worried about drifting towards more and more trying to make people verify their identities online, not seeing the benefits of, 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 of the anonymity brings, I'm not saying we should do nothing. I'm saying, like, focusing on that might not be the way to do it. So for me, I think a couple of things. One is definitely the business model of the big tech platforms. I think we're probably all agreed on that. Because in, in a sense, that it's almost the opposite. The, the, the difficulty we have in staying anonymous online is driving so much anger and hate because people are being constantly targeted. I don't think with hateful content, but with sort of constantly self-reinforcing, personalized, targeted, emotion-filled content. That they're, I think it's getting people more and more like turning the sort of the outrage machine of the internet on. And that's based on get them uh, sort of being able to target us better and better. And if we we're a bit more anonymous online, they wouldn't be able to do that quite so well. So we probably wouldn't have quite as much anger and outrage. So if we can start dealing with the business model of the tech platforms, I think that is one way of doing it. But that's a different way of sort of targeting the problem. And without a doubt, like to me, the policing of all of this is appalling because, as you've rightly said, a lot of times the hate, the, the really serious hate, because I think knockabout online and anger, frustration, heated debates, we've got to allow that to exist because that's part of living in a free society. The really nasty stuff, a lot of the time, and you'll know it too, Margaret, the problem is the police's inability, and often it's a resource, and, and a lack of resource and a lack of technical know-how to actually try to find the people behind this. A lot of times you can find people behind anonymous accounts, but the police won't do it for lots and lots of reasons. And by the way, no one's dealt with my issue of overseas abuse because because there is no obvious answer to that. But it is a really important part of this debate. Yeah. Can I just come back to you on one thing on the free speech question? Because I think that's often brought, I don't want to, I really did believe that, you know, online would support free speech, but women, you know, and women of color uh, who are the ones most li much most likely to be targeted uh, through uh, online abuse? Their freedom to participate is inhibited by their fear of receiving abuse, and that is really important. And then the other thing which we haven't talked about is uh, young people, and you know, them, if there is a real correlation, a causal relationship between, you know. A, uh, uh, suicide sites and on harm and uh, self harm sites, and just generally mental health issues that arise. We can't ignore that. I can see the benefits, and I think any solution is n is never going to be one hundred percent perfect. But you can't ignore the harm to young people and children. Yes, from but I don't what think those things are caused by. Well, we I, don't I think, know. For example, it's no, difficult. But we don't oh, know. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to move you all on now, actually, just because we're getting so many questions in from <laughs> the audience. And I really want to try and get through as many as possible. Um, so starting with a question, I'm glad no, nobody's been decided to, to use the uh, anonymous button tonight. Um, it's a question from Jimmy saying, what do the speakers think explains the failure of the tech giants to police their users properly? Is it greed or lassitude? And similarly, I mean, I want you to sort of take them perhaps both together, um, just for timing reasons. We've got a question from Rose, which talks about the effect. Uh, what effect do you think Facebook's moderators are having on cleaning up Facebook? So, you know, we've been talking about government legislation so far. Can we leave it to the tech companies? Are they doing enough? Is is it working? Um, Jamie, should we start with you? Well, I think generally content moderation as a sort of a part of the business model of the tech platforms certainly until recently, was not taken seriously. It's outsourced to the Philippines and elsewhere. It's very low-paid work. It's very difficult work. There's not the sort of support that's in place. I think um, David will probably know more about the specifics, but I think it's improved over the last three, five years. But for a long time, it was seen as a kind of sort of not particularly important part of the core business model. And so as a result, and this is especially true outside English language um, sort of parts of the platform, there just wasn't enough people that were doing that work. And they weren't well trained, they weren't well, they weren't necessarily uh, well paid, their role wasn't seen as being particularly significant, they often weren't employed directly by the company, but through agencies. So I think like, as, as, these, as these platforms become more and more 
pu publishers in in a sense, and so certainly in their sort of social political role, they're going to have to just keep investing more and more time and training and resources into the role of content moderation. You see, where there is this abuse, I'm not saying it shouldn't be removed. I'm saying it should be, yeah, there should be more effort on focused and targeted ways to remove it when it seems. So that's one, that is, that, I mean, that is one fairly obvious thing, but relatively uncontroversial, I think. And Jamie, would you be happy leaving it to the tech platforms alone to police themselves, given your stance on anonymity and the interference of government? Um, I mean, there are, that sounds I mean, like a no. Really, yeah, I mean, there are, I don't know, so you'd think I'd sort of have an answer for this, wouldn't you, after <laughs> sort of having talked, but I, I, sort of, I sort of veer between thinking, oh, I'm really worried about government, and then the next day I think oh, I'm really worried about the tech platforms. <laughs> So I think I think on the whole I think on the whole it's sort of watch how well they do, have systems to monitor how well they do, and when they're not doing well enough, you uh, you look where you intervene. David, there's not there's not one answer to that. It's it's fair to say that uh, the platforms have increased their investment in content moderation, um, and that that's probably a positive. Um, Jamie mentioned that it's not. That, that that's a, that's a problem outside English language, um, with a notable kind of outlier of, of the German language, where um, Germany has brought in uh, more regulation, and that prompted greater investment. Lo and behold, in German language content moderation, um, there are there are there are downsides to content moderation as a solution. One is that it's it's really tough work, um, and you know we should certainly support efforts to get content moderators better working conditions, proper psychological support, et cetera. But it's, it's always going to be tough work. Um, it's, it's, it's also, I think, tricky, you know, is always going to raise kind of challenges in terms of where you draw lines and, and how you balance freedom of expression, et cetera. And that's why I, I, I would advocate that alongside thinking about content moderation, we do also think about what else about the design of a platform could kind of tackle the need for moderation in the first place in terms of what what about these platforms brings out the best or the worst in people um you know jamie mentioned the kind of aspects of the business model that you know thrive on generating outrage and polarization rather than promoting understanding um i think online disinhibition of which probably this the, the factor the ingredient within online disinhibition that we are most equipped to tackle is anonymity is another such factor where we that yes, there are trade-offs here in all, in all these design choices, but are the platforms on their own with their incentives, their ideological hinterlands, you know, these are you know, libertarian companies from a, you know, a much more libertarian country than ours, are they the best sole decision makers of where to land those trade-offs, how to make those design choices? Um, I think probably... There was a there was a point where you could say maybe, um, but you know, look at the internet we've ended up with. Um, yes, there are, our, our government has all kinds of flaws, has all kinds of challenges of ca catching up with with the digital age. But we need some to in, to introduce social considerations into this design, and I can't see where that can come from. It's not from some form of democratically man mandated regulation. Margaret, um, how do you think the tech platforms are doing? Um, I'm much tougher. Um, I think uh, it, they, they, these algorithms, I agree with David, they could change the algorithms tomorrow if they chose to. And that would, uh, 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 you know, support getting a lot of this, uh, you know, particularly don't think just about the abuse that people like and I get. Think about the stuff that kids get, you know, and, and the links in there to uh, a child protect, you know, all the stuff that we want to protect children. So, you know, the links that that encourage them to get onto suicide sites or self-harm sites or stuff that you know impacts on their mental health i think all that and then also think about the anti-vax stuff you know where actually when there was finally enough pressure they did a little bit more than the platforms so i think they deliberately don't manage their algorithms and i think they are totally motivated by greed and i think in those circumstances um uh you have to have intervention i i'm not you know it, uh, Ofcom would be the agency that would be responsible. So it'd be an arm's length agency from government itself. So it would be MPs, 
bobbing up and down saying, get rid of this, get rid of that. It would be regulated by a, 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 an agency distant from government. But if you leave it, they've had long enough. They've had long enough and they have simply failed and they fail because they make money on the back of it. Well, Margaret, you mentioned the age problem there and how we've seen, seen teenagers being, um, you know, sort of often lured into self-harm, suicide, all sorts of awful corners of the internet. Um, I'm going to try and sneak in another very quick question before we move on to the next one. This is from Sergio Aguero, who's asking, why has the government removed age veri verification from the online safety bill? A lot of us are asking that question. And uh, it's an issue that we're also campaigning on to get back into the bill. So I agree. And Jamie, where do you stand on that? I mean, sort of the, the downside of having a completely open internet is that an awful lot of children are seeing stuff which is possibly sort of influencing them to, to take their own lives, or at least sort of even hardcore porn, which is, you know, it's changing the way people are growing up. It's changing society. Where do you stand on that? Uh, on, on what? Age verification in particular? Age verification. I mean, would you would you put in some regulation on like that? Uh, yeah, I... It's... I'm not sure. It's another one where I don't really have an, a fully fleshed out answer because I've, I've never worked out how you'd be able to build the, the correct sort of technology to make that actually work and function smoothly. So maybe, I mean, again, it's one of those tricky ones that if you can, if you can create the technology to make it work really effectively, then fine. One of the biggest problems that I had, and it's actually the reason I wrote the book about the dark in the first place, was just how little parents monitored what their kids ever did online, even had the remotest idea what sort of platforms they were going on to. Parents' own sort of internet literacy in terms of being able to put on their own firewalls, they're just being, have like rings being run around them by the kids. And I mean, if you can't, I mean, so any age verification system that's put into place, they're gonna come, they're gonna come up with quite simple ways to get around it. If the parents themselves aren't sort of, up to speed with how how to make it work so the first thing on all of this was always like how can parents actually take more responsibility and sort of understand oh, a bit better jamie don't blame the parents don't blame the parents i'm sorry margaret it's embarrassing i'm sorry no, no i'm sorry i'm not i don't I'm know how old you the solution to this margaret i'm well, not blaming yeah. parents i'm not blaming parents entirely but I think when I would, the way that I always used to think about it was when I used to get up to naughty things when I was younger, my parents kind of could understand what they were because they were more or less the same things that they used to do. Now it's a completely different world, and I know how hard that is. But to me, it's a bit of a derogation of duty when I hear parents say all the time, all oh, the kids are upstairs on the internet, I've got no idea what they're doing. And I think, why don't you try to learn? Why I don't you spend some can... time on these platforms? Hang on a minute, Jamie. I mean, like? uh, to be honest, you not think they I think should bother? Most, I think most parents do it. try, but they can't. Yeah, no, no, most parents do try. But if you really think you're going to spend 24 7 looking after your no. The, the, make it, I, no. And let me that. just say, let me just say something else in response to what you've said. I think for you, the 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 best is the enemy of the good. You know, none of these solutions that we are proposing are totally fail safe. You know, whether it's age verification, all that stuff, it's not going to be a hundred percent fail safe. But it's better than where we are, and it's such a fast changing environment. No doubt, the things that I'm proposing today will probably be out of date in three, four, five years' time. We've just got to recognise, you've just got to continuously look at, 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 at how you respond. But I do think for you, Jamie, the best is the enemy of the good. But, but Margaret, can I just say, already, we agree, <laughs> like, tech platform business model, big problem. Yeah. Inability of the police to actually tackle the cases that they find, big problem. I also agree with, the, with some of David's suggestions about can you make it easier for users to see, to offer the option of self-verification now. So there are actually a lot of things where I totally agree there are things we can do. There are things we can do to improve it. I'm not saying just leave it as it is. David, very quickly, do you have a, any thoughts on age verification? Yeah, I, I think history will probably not judge us very kindly when it looks at this time when we thought we, we were comfortable with exposing the majority of children over 10 to hardcore pornography. That just, you know, something needs adjusting there. And I think one of the challenges that the parents I speak to feel is that on the one hand, 
they do want to protect their kids from this stuff. They also recognise all the benefits of the internet. And what we really need to be striving for is to give children a right to access a version of the internet that is safe for them. I think the age verification solutions do exist. They're not perfect, but there are a range of companies that have developed secure, privacy-respecting ways to verify age. Um, Parliament can specify in the online safety law the minimum standards for those and mandate companies to use them. And I think, look, look I, was, I was a proud owner of a fake ID when I was like 15, 16. I'm pretending to be a member of Leicester University Students Union. Um, obviously, people will get round these things. <laughs> but one of the things that child psychologists tell us, which I think is really important on this, is that when a child is in a space that is, it, it, if a child accesses a space that they know they've gone through the rigmarole of evading a system that's designed to keep them out, that in itself is useful. It means they know that they're somewhere they shouldn't be. That sets a boundary. That in itself is a protection measure. So I think Margaret's right. We shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Of course, whatever measure we, measures we come up with, some people will circumvent. But the, 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 even the signal of an effort, as well as it protecting a lot of people, absolutely, it just at least tells children this is stuff you shouldn't be seeing. Now, I want to move on to another question from the audience, which covers a subject we haven't talked about enough tonight, really. And it's misinformation is a much greater threat to our society than online abuse. Can the panel give us a few suggestions on how we can deal with it? Um, Jamie. Well, as you can tell, I don't have answers to a lot of these problems. <laughs> but this is the it, downside it, of having a completely it, democratic, it, it, open it, it, internet. <laughs> Yeah, I think misinformation we might find is probably slightly harder to work out how to deal with. Um, uh, and certainly, I, I really don't think that online anonymity is, is the cause of misinformation. And if you look online at the things that you would consider to be you know, uh, dangerously uh, inaccurate, a lot of it comes from very, very famous, verified public people. So this is going to be this is going to be a, this is a this is a much trickier uh, much trickier problem. The only thing, and it's really I know it's going to sound really sort of really basic and boring, but I, I'm I've only ever been able to sort of see that the solution has to lie in a in a, in a change to how we teach um, information literacy in schools. Now for a while, for a while it was seen that well. It, what we need to do is teach critical thinking. Yeah, that's fine, but that has its problems as well. But some additional digital literacy is added to that. How do Google's algorithms work and how, do, how does Facebook's business model work and all the rest of it? And I think that's all well and good, and we do need to teach all of that. But I think something slightly deeper is going on here. Um, a lot of the uh, sort of... But the reasons why people believe certain things that we might find uh, troubling or sort of end up spreading information that isn't accurate is, is because of our own cognitive biases. It's not just because the digital platforms are feeding us nonsense. It's because we also have a bias in ourselves to want to read information that we already agree with and so on. Mm -hmm. And so I think any any education-based solution to this where we sort of try to improve media literacy has to also include quite a lot about human psychology and individual cognitive biases and sort of the anchoring effect and the echo chamber effect and all these other sort of sociological and psychological biases that we have and I still don't think we quite teach that well enough in school so that's one I'm sort of I suppose more hopeful about because I think that is something we, we really can change. David? Well, I, I wouldn't discount, Jamie, the role that anonymity plays pl plays in disinformation. I'm just to give you one example, there was a study of um, uh, Muslim candidates in the last US congressional elections, which kind of picked out uh, uh, the different role that different kinds of accounts played in um, uh, in uh, spreading uh, Islamophobic disinformation about those candidates. And you're right, Jamie, but some of the, most of the originators of a lot of that information were, were, named, were, were named accounts, were real people. But only 11 of the top 40, what they termed amplifier accounts, the accounts that then pumped that stuff out and got, got, got it to a wider audience, were authentic. Um, and I, I think most organised disinformation operations use huge numbers of sock puppet accounts, um, bot accounts, inauthentic accounts to 
trick both humans and platforms algorithms that extreme ideas false ideas are more mainstream than they really are um now you see that as well with fraud and scams so the, the the commercial equivalent is the fake product review like there's no one magic bullet anonymity isn't the sole factor just but design factors that can make play a big role just to give you one little example a positive one from twitter they introduced a, a prompt before someone shares a link on twitter asking them if they've read read the thing first that appears to have had quite a, a significant dampening effect on the spread of disinformation those are the, but you know that's the kind of thing that happens thanks to pressure it's not something which their business model incentivizes i agree mm -hmm. as well all this stuff about education is important um but, but that's a long-term thing and i don't think we can place all our hope in that margaret what do we do about disinformation um, I, just one thing I wanted to say. I mean, we talked. Jamie talked about the global nature of the internet and uh, the alleged uh, Russian interference in, for example, the Brexit vote here in the UK and the US presidential ele uh, elections is an example of misin. You know, alleged. She says quickly, alleged <laughs> misin misinformation being uh, 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 deployed to impact in a really insidious way on, on uh, outcomes of uh, important uh, uh, democratic occasions, both in uh, the USA and here. So, you know, anonymity allegedly supports that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I completely agree with Jamie about education, completely agree with that. And I think we, uh, again, that ought to be, uh, we ought to do what we can. And I'm conscious actually that I haven't talked enough about that. And I, I take that away as a sort of learning point from this debate. And the third thing I wanted to say, this is one thing that Dean Doris has done a good thing about, because she has suggested that we would should introduce a new offence of deliberately sending a false message. And that introducing that as a criminal offence, I think will support, if the police resource sufficiently, and I accept that point, but will support, um, again, uh, 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 bearing down on where, mis won't get rid of it all, it'll help us to bear down on misinformation. And if we were only to do that with direct liability, which I talked about earlier, so you actually create a liability on um, uh, the directors themselves to, to take off their platform, uh, deliberate misinformation. I think you would have the beginnings of a, an, a, a coordinated attempt to bear down, but not completely get rid of in misinformation. I'm afraid we are really out of time. We've got some great questions from the audience. I'm so sorry we haven't had a chance to get through them all. Uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in one, a very quick one for Jamie before we, we finish. And that's just um, from Julia, who asks, did you foresee how freedom of speech would be abused online when you first became interested in the Internet? No. Is how the dream ends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I suppose I, suppose I was... Um... I was very, I'd been just like reading loads of like John Stuart Mill and being all like, oh, the marketplace of ideas and the sort of clashing of free mm. ideas leads to a synthesis and it'll be mm. fantastic. And it gives voice to a lot of, um, a lot of, pe a lot of uh, sort of previously underserved or underheard communities who finally get their chance to get, you know, and, and I think most of us, we talked about it before the, the, the live button was hit, the, how we all thought, we all thought that. And we're maybe all slightly naive about how that could be manipulated by powerful people and powerful forces for lots of reasons. So I, I definitely didn't know. I, I definitely didn't force. I definitely didn't foresee that at all. So with that sense of, um, <laughs> of the tree being curdled, <laughs> um, I'm afraid we've completely run out of time. But thank you so much to tonight's guests, to Jamie Bartlett, David Babs, and Margaret Hodge, and thanks to Intelligence Squared for hosting this event. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. We've had some brilliant questions. I'm so sorry we ran out of time to get through them all. But do carry on the debate online. Hashtag IQ2. Thanks again.